Hello and welcome along to today's Premier Unbelievable Live. I'm Justin Briley, joined uh, by my co-host Ruth Jackson and we'll introduce our special guest in just a moment's time. But uh, hello, Ruth. Hi. Good to be I'm here, shouting. isn't it? I have a microphone. I don't need to shout. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, look, we'll do what we always do and say um, lots of people joining us here for today's live webinar. But our special guest uh, on today's show is, of course, William Lane Craig, Christian philosopher, author and founder of Reasonable Faith, a ministry that engages skeptics and equips Christians to understand and defend their faith. He's been described as the one Christian <laughs> apologist who seems to have put the fear of God into many of my fellow atheists. That was Atheist Sam Harris. And Bill is arguably the world's leading academic defender of Christian belief. Yeah, Bill has debated dozens of atheists and non-Christians over the years, and he's published over 50 books, 200 peer-reviewed articles. And this is an incredible fact. His Kalam cosmological argument is the most studied argument for God in contemporary Western philosophy. This live event is your opportunity to ask the William Lane Craig anything. So do have a think about what questions or objections um, you've got about your Christian faith that you find the most challenging or important. Absolutely. Now, um, you, you may be a Christian uh, tuning in. Uh, you may be not a non-Christian, a skeptic. We, we, we would love to hear from everybody across the board. Uh, do please um, submit your questions. We will then filter some of those questions, um, select the ones that we're going to try and ask Bill. But welcome along, Bill. How are you doing? Thank you very well, I'm pleased to say. It's good to be with you. It's been a little while since we had you on the show. Normally, obviously, it's in our pre-recorded format. Uh, probably, uh, probably, I think it was back in lockdown, the early days of lockdown, that we had you on for a live show. So it's been a little while that we've been able to do something like this with a with a live audience. Um, tell tell us what you've been up to recently. You've always got a new project, some research on the go. What's what's currently going on? What is going on now is that for the last two years, I have been working on my magnum opus, which is a systematic philosophical theology of the Christian religion. Uh, I've been in this now for two years, uh, and every day I am writing uh, and reading and working on this systematic theology. It has become something of a magnificent obsession for me uh, and, and occupies almost all my time. Fantastic, fantastic. What what are some of um, the highlights? I mean, looking back on your career, Bill, you've obviously turned your attention to many different areas of study, but you've also been in, engaged in some fascinating encounters over the years. Yeah. Are there any sort of particular highlights that come to mind as you think about some of the stages you've shared with well-known personalities, both with and without faith? Well, in terms of my academic work, as a philosopher, I have specialized on what's called the coherence of theism, which is a philosophical study of the attributes of God. And I think my study of divine eternity, that is to say God's relationship to time, and then divine aseity, that is to say God's self-existence, have been especially rewarding, just uh, profoundly rich studies that have increased my understanding uh, so much of who God is and what he's like and how he relates to our world. So on the academic side, I think those two areas stand out. In terms of the speaking ministry, I have loved some of the uh, tours that I have done of the UK, debating at places like uh, the Cambridge Union and the Oxford Debating Society, as well as um, in London and various universities around the, the, the nation. It's it's just been wonderful to have that sort of experience uh, in Great Britain. Well, we've so loved having you. Um, Bill, one of the questions we'd love to ask is around, you know, what do you think the current state of apologetics is in the church? I guess with a capital C, because you do lots of stuff with lots of different churches. I mean, are you pleased with the way that the churches are engaging with the intellectual side of faith, would you say? Well, I think there is a significant minority movement within the church today that is very interested in intellectually engaging with our culture, and that is tremendously encouraging. On the other hand, I, I do think it still tends to be the minority. I, I think that for the average Christian, he's just too preoccupied with uh, his rebellious teenagers or 
uh, a failing marriage or financial pressures or or job and uh, other worries to be much concerned about these intellectual questions. And so it's it's still difficult to motivate people to really become intellectually engaged with their faith. I, I do get the sense, though, that for me, just in the time that I've been running The Unbelievable Show, and, and The Unbelievable Show started really in, in the heyday of the new atheism, it felt like the church was perhaps caught on the back foot by mm. that very dogmatic anti-theism that that mm. movement represented. And I do feel like ministries like yours and others have really grown up in response to that. So I think we're in, you know, th th there's a lot more general awareness, at least, of apologetics and an inter intellectual defense of faith than, than there was, let's say, 15 to 20 years ago, Bill. I yeah. don't know if that's your experience. Well, and that's certainly true, Justin. In the academy, uh, I was speaking in the pew, in the church pew, but in the academy, oh my goodness, the Renaissance of Christian philosophy and New Testament studies and uh, physics and so forth has just been tremendously encouraging. And my hope and prayer is that this will filter down to the man in the pew in the coming generations, and that he also will become more intellectually engaged with his faith. And as you mentioned, the, the conferences um, in apologetics that are often hosted today, Premier has done several of these, uh, the attendance has been tremendous uh, compared to 20 years ago. Mm. So it, that is very encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can't uh, help but ask as well, Bill, because it's, it's such a wonderful feature of your background. There's a skull <laughs> on your on the shelf behind you. Um, would oh. you mind would you mind telling us or even bringing it down so that you could tell us exactly what what why there is this this hominid skull? In the OK, just a second. <laughs> Bill's just reaching for the skull now, <laughs> bringing it forward. Here it is. My most recent book was <laughs> In Quest of the Historical Adam. Um, and this is a life-size uh, replica of the skull of Homo heidelbergensis, which was discovered at Broken Hill Mine in Rhodesia. And I identify Adam and Eve as being members of this species of Homo heidelbergensis, which lived uh, around 750,000 years ago. And so my wife, Jan, bought me this replica skull for my birthday last year, and it is one of my favorite possessions. Oh, well, wow. that's fantastic. That's fantastic. What, what a great artifact to have on the shelf behind you. Well, we may get some questions about Adam and Eve, which, of course, has Good. been a major major part of your research in recent years, Bill. Mm. And and if anyone wants to go back in the archives, you had a wonderful conversation with Joshua Swamidas around the time that your book released on on that subject. So uh, so that's worth going and looking for. Um, uh, now, we, we should also mention uh, that there's something very exciting that's just recently been launched by Reasonable Faith. It's called Equip. We're going to share a quick video of what it is, and then we'll ask you about it, Bill. So let's watch this trailer for Equip. Just before we hear more about Equip, I just want to say where some of you are all watching from. We've got Singapore, where apparently it's 4 a.m. So thank you so much for your commitment. Oh. South Africa, <laughs> Munich, Philippines, France. Um, we've got lots of people in the US, England, Scotland, France, Canada, Sydney, Finland. I feel like we've got sort of almost every country represented. <laughs> but Bill, do tell us more about Equip because it sounds very exciting. This is a program designed to train especially young people 
in the art of articulating and defending what they believe as Christians. And these series of courses are based upon these very special uh, Zangmeister videos that we've developed at Reasonable Faith on various arguments for the existence of God, objections to theism, the evidence for Jesus, uh, and objections to Christian exclusivism. And we've developed seven of these courses so far based on these videos, and they're layered so that the student will be gradually taken through these from one level to another, and along the way, he will take quizzes to test his comprehension of the material. Now, nobody's grading you. You're not going to flunk <laughs> out or anything like that. But they are a measure to make sure that the student is grasping the material. And so this is a way of trying to make this vast body of work that I've accumulated available to folks in a simple, digestible way that is very usable. That, that's fantastic. I, I just love the way in which, you know, we, we can use the internet in these ways. And and uh, and it sounds like a really excellent way of, of unpacking and going deeper with some of the, the stuff that you've already obviously popularized so widely, Bill. Um, right. Probably time that we started to to ask you a few questions, Bill. Great. Um, and they have been flooding in. My goodness. We <laughs> We we normally get a lot of questions, but tonight we've got we've got. I've already got seventy two questions. Well, at nearly a hundred actually, if you include the ones that we've uh, selected oh, as well. Of course, but, yes. So so we're 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 already well underway here. <laughs> but why don't we start with one that I I think you know is a good introductory question. Carter Yancey wants to know, Bill. Many Christians are skeptical that faith needs philosophy. How would you explain to a Christian who's skeptical of philosophy why you think it is important? Why don't we start there? I think in virtue of being a Christian, you are committed to certain philosophical theses. For example, the existence of God, the objectivity and the knowability of truth, the objectivity of moral values, I would say the reality of the soul and life beyond the grave. All of these are enormous and important philosophical commitments. And they're part and parcel of the Christian faith. So every Christian, in virtue of being a Christian, is a philosopher. The only question is whether he's going to be a good one or not. <laughs> and so I think that all of us, as part of Christian discipleship, of being learners of Jesus, which is what disciple means, need to love the Lord our God with all our mind and to exercise our minds in the understanding of Christian doctrine. Right. Well, I mean, I feel like lots of people will resonate with this question here from Donald, who says, I have an adult son who is a deconstructed Christian. He was formerly mm. a strong Christian leader, deeply engaged in ministry and evangelism. After college, he began to ask questions that his religious spiritual peer group could not answer. And over a period of time, he reached a decision point that he claims to be materialist, not believing in God, spiritual beings or a human soul. And he goes, goes on to say, please recommend an approach to begin a conversation on the reality of God and the resurrected Jesus. And as I say, Bill, I feel like lots of people will have um, a similar experience where you're just not even knowing where to start that conversation with yes. a, a former Christian, deconstructed Christian. Yes. Well, what a shame that he was looking to his peer group for guidance rather than to truth. Um, and I would recommend my book On Guard for a Beginner, which lays out the importance of the question of God, and then gives a number of arguments as to why we should believe in a transcendent, personal uh, creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute moral value. And then it also gets into the subject of whether or not this transcendent creator and designer has revealed himself decisively in the person of Jesus. So that would be a great place to begin. If one wants to go deeper, my book, Reasonable Faith, is then a more intermediate level to which one might graduate after doing On Guard. That's really helpful, Bill. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting question from John, who says, 
Dr. Craig, which argument used to defend Christianity do you find the weakest or even harmful? And have you ever had to change your mind on an issue or an argument? I, it's not a question that often comes up. Normally, it's what, what's the best one, you know, but but uh, yeah. do you th- have you heard bad ones that you would say, no, that's that's really not a good way of defending faith? Well, I've certainly changed my mind on certain issues. For example, I once thought that the cosmological argument from contingency was not sound because it depended upon a very strong principle of sufficient reason that seemed to me to be self-defeating. And it wasn't until I read Stephen Davis's defense of the contingency argument that I became persuaded that this, in fact, is a sound argument for God and have since defended it. Similarly, I thought that the ontological argument was not a sound argument for God's existence, that it was an attempt to define God into existence, until I read Alvin Plantinga's Nature of Necessity and became convinced that this is um, a sound and plausible argument for God's Mm -hmm. existence. So yes, I have changed my mind on certain key issues like that. Now, the worst argument, (laughs) well, I suppose... I mean, besides thinking of just utterly invalid or fallacious Mm -hmm. argument, I would say the argument from fulfilled prophecy is one that is hard to make because you have to show that the prophecy was intended to speak of these events in the future. uh, And then you have to show that those events actually did historically occur in fulfillment of that prophecy, and that's very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. So I think the argument from fulfilled prophecy is one that um, is hard to is, put It's through. tougher to defend, yes. I suppose any argument as well can be formulated in ways that are better or worse, and, and so you inevitably get people who who make a real hash of what could be a, a, a you know a fairly good argument for God. But yes, and that, that is the lesson of or, the contingency yeah, argument yeah. or the ontological argument. Certainly there are invalid or unsound forms of those arguments, but that doesn't mean that the core of the argument uh, is incapable of being properly and cogently articulated. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, this might be an opportunity to hold up your skull, Bill. So I'll just give you a pre-warning there. This is a question from Sheila, which, you know, I would imagine, again, is echoed by lots of people. She says, here's a big one, Bill. My husband believes that the Adam and Eve story is a myth. He is a scientist. However, I can think of no better explanation of how sin entered the world, assuming that creation was originally perfect than that so-called myth. What do you think? I think that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are quasi-mythical. That is to say, I think that they exhibit many of the characteristics of what folklorists and classicists called myth. Now, I hasten to add that when I use that word, I am not talking about myth in the popular sense of the word of a falsehood, like mm-hmm. the myth of the low-calorie diet or the myth mm-hmm. of the self-made man. Rather, for classicists and folklorists, myths are uh, narratives that uh, feature deities that attempt to ground the values and institutions in the author's uh, current society in events in the deep primordial past. And certainly, Genesis 1 to 11 is aimed at doing precisely that. Now, it's characteristic of myth as a literary genre that it is full of figurative language or symbols that need not be taken literally. And I think that's exactly what you find in Genesis 1 to 11. The starkest example of this is the description of God in Genesis 2 and 3 as some sort of a humanoid physical person walking in the cool of the day in the garden looking for Adam and Eve in the bushes. This is clearly an anthropomorphic description of God, whom the author of the Pentateuch believes to be an incorporeal transcendent being who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. So I would agree with her husband uh, that it is quasi-mythical, and that's not a threat to the truth of these narratives. But I would add that it is 
mytho-historical, the presence of the genealogies that transform these primeval stories into a primeval history uh, showed that there is definitely a historical interest on the part of the author of the Pentateuch, and that just as he indisputably regarded Abraham and his descendants as historical, so he thought that Abraham's ancestors were historical. So I see Genesis 1 to 11 as an intriguing, uh, fascinating blend of myth and history, real people, real events, but described in the figurative uh, and metaphorical language of myth. Well, let's let's stick with that theme, because David Harris wants to ask, um, I recently read some sections of your new book on the historicity of Adam and really enjoyed it. My Mm -hmm. question is, as I rethink Genesis 1 to 11, I am moving away from a literalistic reading. And this has led me to wonder how best to find meaning in these passages. If a literalistic approach is not the best way, and I I agree with you on this, then how do I read these well? And what are perhaps some resources you recommend to help me pursue the intended meaning of these passages? I think what you need to ask yourself as you read the narratives is what is the theological point that the author of the Pentateuch is trying to make? For example, clearly in chapter one, the point is that the things of nature, the stars and the planets, the animals and the vegetation are not gods, nor infused with God. Uh, Rather, they are just natural products that are the creation of the transcendent creator of the universe. Um, And so it results in a desacralized view of nature. Nature is not full of gods. It's not a haunted house. Uh, and therefore is open to rational exploration and discovery. So it it struck me forcefully that the desacralization of nature that paved the way for modern science that is often credited to the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers, pride of place belongs to these Hebrew authors of Genesis 1 to 11, particularly Genesis 1, who enunciated a desacralized view of nature, which is the natural product of this transcendent creator. And so look to see what is the point that the author is trying to make. Let me give you an analogy that may be helpful. Jesus' parables were not meant to be taken literally. These were not historical stories. They were stories that he made up to illustrate a point. And I think in almost every case, it's pretty obvious what the point of the parable is trying to teach. You you read the parable and say, what is it that Jesus is trying to teach by the story of the Good Samaritan uh, or the story of the prodigal son? And in the same way that you can see the central point that this parable teaches, even though it's not literal, uh, nevertheless, I think you can do the same thing with Genesis 1 to 11 and see the central theological points that emerge there. And I, I list 10 such um, points in my quest for the historical Adam. Well, there's another question on this topic, and then perhaps we might take some from a slightly different route. This is from James in Brighton, and he says, Mm -hmm. how can all humans be descended from Adam and bear the image of God, considering the geographical fossil evidence of humanoids humanoids being so widely distributed throughout the globe? Well, this requires you to push the date of Adam and Eve very far into the past. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that I identified Adam and Eve as members of the species Homo heidelbergensis, or Heidelberg man. Heidelberg man was the common ancestor of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. He was the stem species from which Neanderthals and Homo sapiens emerged. So by placing Adam and Eve in the deep past, around 750,000 years ago, that gives ample time for Heidelberg man to diffuse throughout the world, and indeed his skeletons are found throughout the world. And he migrated into Africa, into uh, the Middle East and, and uh, Europe, and in Africa evolved into Homo sapiens in Europe and Asia, he evolved into Neanderthals. 
So that problem of geographical distribution is met by having a sufficiently early date for these persons. One more question before we move on. Um, <laughs> and there's a fantastic amount of chat going on today. It's very lively in the chat this evening. Mm, uh, lots of um, back and forth on the nature of Genesis as we've been talking it through, Bill. Um, but but here's just one more from Jonathan, who says, I commend your book, In Quest for the Historical Adam, as I believe this work was done with the utmost integrity, sincerity and objective scholarship. My question is this. Has the content of that book made you question any other material within other works you've published? Would you change or adjust any material from past publications? Yes, thank you for that question. It did cause me to revise uh, one important view that I had. As a result of my study of the resurrection of Jesus, I concluded that physical human death is the result of sin, uh, and that it is because of the fall of Matt, Adam that human beings are mortal and need the resurrection to solve that problem. As a result of my study of the historical Adam, I came to the conclusion that that view is in fact wrong. I think that Adam and Eve were created mortal, just like any ordinary biological mm. organisms. They would have eventually died if they lived long enough in the garden. And, and evidence for that is the fact that if they were naturally immortal, there was no reason to have the tree of life in the garden. Mm. The tree of life was there because it was a sort of fountain of youth, as it were, that would continually rejuvenate them. And when they fell into sin, they were expelled from the garden precisely so that they wouldn't eat of the tree of life. Moreover, you notice that when God says, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die, and yet they don't drop over dead mm -hmm. when they sin, but they are immediately spiritually alienated and estranged from God. And that suggests that the death spoken of there is spiritual death mm. that ensues from sin, not physical death. And so when you go to the New Testament, it's so interesting in Romans 5, Paul is talking about spiritual death. And what is the remedy for spiritual death? It's justification. Mm -hmm. Justification remedies spiritual death. But in 1 Corinthians, where he's talking about physical death, what is the remedy for physical death? It's not justification. It's resurrection from mm -hmm. the dead. So the resurrection remedies the mortality that we share and conquers physical death, but the answer to spiritual death is not resurrection, it's justification. Mm. Fantastic. So that was a major change. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, let's move on. I mean, there may well be some more questions about mm -hmm. Adam and Eve coming in, but if we move just, just a little bit, um, lots of people have been talking about artificial intelligence recently, particularly chat, chat GBT. We've got a question in here from Aaron, which says, do you find any utility in artificial intelligence such as chat GBT? Have you experimented with it much? Um, but I guess, yeah, what, what do you think about it, Bill? What, what's your opinion on artificial intelligence? I, I haven't. Um, I prefer to do my own research uh, rather than to ask some artificial intelligence. I, I think <laughs> it can be useful when you want to know certain geographical facts or what's on the telly or uh, who's playing, you know, Manchester on the weekend or something. <laughs> but when it comes to really serious things, I, I don't think you should use it. I, I noticed that somebody actually reconstructed a debate through artificial intelligence between me and Richard Dawkins. Hmm. And when I read it, I thought, man, if I did that bad, I would be ashamed of myself against Richard Dawkins. So I don't think this artificial intelligence was very intelligent at all. <laughs> well, well, sticking with our, I mean, one of the questions that I think this new technology and the fact that it does seem to have come up on in leaps and bounds in recent years has raised, Bill, is, is whether we are approaching some sense in which 
technology itself, computers and so on, could in some sense become intelligent in the human sense, in, in yeah. having meaning and purpose and agency and, and you know, being able to associate ideas in a meaningful way. Do, do you think we'll ever get to that point where, where there is a sort of human level intelligence coming I'm out of technology? I'm not equipped to say, Justin. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 my opinion wouldn't be worth anything on this because I am simply not expert on AI. Well, what, well, here's a related question then, one that I know you have thought about a bit more, which is from Michael, who says, what, Bill, is your theory of consciousness? Specifically, um, Michael wants to know supervenience with regards to mental and physical properties. Uh -huh. And do near-death experiences affect your view of consciousness at all? I haven't been very persuaded by what I know about near-death experiences. Um, but it seems to me that we want to say that the soul uh, is the seat of consciousness and is a substance distinct from the body. If you say that the soul or consciousness is merely supervenient upon the brain, um, then that is incompatible with mental causation, because in that case, all the causation is from physical brain state to physical brain state. And conscious just rides along on the surface in a causably impotent way. And so there is no mental causation. For the same reason, there is no freedom of the will, because mm. these mental states have no ability to do anything. Everything is determined physically by the brain states and the stimuli that they receive there would as a result be no moral agency either because the deterministic outcomes of brain states are not morally significant. Uh, it's hard to explain intentionality on, on this basis either, that I have the ability to think about things that don't even exist. So for all of these reasons, I think it's very important to maintain that Whatever the relationship between the mind and the brain, the brain, the mind is more than just a supervenient reality. It can be correlated with brain states, but um, I don't think we can say that it's, it's simply supervenient on them. Well, but we've had quite a lot of questions, understandably, in a in an event like this around suffering and evil. Oh. Uh, so, I mean, how would you approach the question of mm -hmm. suffering? If God is good, if he exists, yes. why would he allow suffering? I like to draw a distinction between the intellectual problem of suffering and the emotional problem of suffering. The intellectual problem is how to reconcile the existence of an all-loving, all-powerful God with the horrible evil and suffering in the world. The emotional problem consists of how to dissolve people's dislike of a God who would allow them or others to suffer so. And I'm persuaded, Ruth, as I talk to folks, that for most people, the problem of suffering is not really an intellectual problem. They've never really thought about it deeply. It's an emotional problem um, and therefore needs to be resolved, I think, in, in an emotionally. Intellectually, I would say that the problem of suffering and evil puts a burden of proof on the atheist's shoulder that is so heavy that it, it is unsustainable. The atheist has to show that it is either impossible or highly improbable that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering and evil we see. And that involves probability judgments way beyond our ability to make with any sort of confidence. So, I don't think there is a good intellectual objection to the existence of an all-powerful and all-good God based on evil and suffering in the world. Now, the emotional problem still remains, however, and there I would say that those who are going through terrible suffering need to meditate upon the cross of Christ. When we meditate on the cross of Christ, we see that God himself took upon himself in Christ incomprehensible suffering, even though he was totally innocent. And why did he do it? Because he loves us 
so much and so was willing to bear that suffering that we deserved as the punishment for our sins in order to redeem us and bring us into an eternal relationship with himself, far more wonderful than we could ever think or imagine. And I think when we think about the extent of his love and what he was willing to endure for us, that can give us the emotional strength and and courage to bear the cross that God asks us to bear during this finite human existence. I'll ask a follow-up question to that, Bill. Um, James asks, well, so first of all, says thank you for your amazing commitment to upholding truth. But James works with a youth group in a church in Brighton and mm-hmm. says, could you help me explain as simply as possible a response to their question? Why would God, being all-powerful, create a world with sin and suffering in it? Why allow so much pain? And and perhaps this is another the question, why not just skip straight to heaven? Why do we have to go through oh. this veil of Veil of well, suffering I think that the, the second question provides the key to the first. Okay. Heaven is not something that God imposes upon people independently of their free will. Rather, this world is a veil of decision-making in which we are allowed to freely determine our own eternal destiny by freely choosing for God or against God. And, and so God isn't some kind of a divine rapist who imposes himself upon us, uh, and therefore he cannot simply send everybody to heaven, which would violate their freedom of the will. Now, what that means is that God has created a world at a certain epistemic distance from himself, a certain arm's length from himself, so that he doesn't overwhelm our free wills by his glory and power. And I think, Justin, honestly, it is not at all improbable that only in a world suffused with natural and moral evil would the optimal number of people freely come to know God and embrace his salvation. And so I think God's overriding aim in human history is to bring as many people as possible Mm. Mm. into the kingdom of God freely uh, with as little loss as possible, and that doing that may well require permitting enormous amounts of suffering and evil in the world. It's such an interesting way of looking at it, Bill. I've heard something that sort of sounds similar that, that I think goes back to Alvin Plantinger, where he talked about the fact that sometimes people object to, you know, that that there are other possible worlds, for instance, where we could have had a world with slightly less suffering or something, and and God would still have, you know, been able to f- fulfill His purposes. But I think planting His response to that was, it's just possible that the, a world in which Christ had to come in and mm. die a sacrificial death, demonstrating the the greatest possible love possible, is the best of all possible worlds that we are actually living in, despite the. You know all the evidence that appears to be to the contrary. The fact that it's a world which required Christ's sacrifice and the great yeah. good that that exists in and of itself is, in fact, a, an indicator that, that we may well be living in the best of all possible worlds because of what Christ has done. In that sense, planning his hypothesis is so interesting because, on this view, the self-sacrificial atoning death of Christ for our sins is an incommensurable good, so that when you weigh different possible worlds against each other, worlds that include this incommensurable good far outweigh these worlds without it. Now, think about that. In order for Christ to die for your sins, the world has to be full of sin, mm-hmm. and therefore evil would be a concomitant automatically of the atoning death of Christ. So that is really an interesting uh, perspective, and I think is one that is well worth consideration. Well, just on that, before we move away from suffering, because as I said, there's lots of different questions around this. Mark Bashir has said this, loving parents don't want to see their children in pain. So why did God allow Jesus to suffer so much? Because he loves us so much that the father and the son agreed that the son would bear the punishment for our sins so that we might be redeemed and come into this eternal love relationship with 
God. Um, one of the most popular Bible verses is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the atoning death of Christ is tremendous testimony to the self-sacrificial love of God, and particularly for Jesus' voluntary self-sacrifice for us. A bit more of a personal question, Bill, because what you've described is obviously an, an important part of the Christian understanding of the gospel and, and what it means to, to accept Christ. Um, so you can, if this if this pries too much into personal conversations, feel free to say, but but Keegan wants to know, what was it like talking to Ben Shapiro, a well-known talk show host who oh. is Jewish himself by background, especially in regards to the gospel? I know that you obviously had a, an interview on Ben Shapiro's show, Bill. Yes. Um, can you share anything about sort of what you felt, how the conversation went and, yeah, and how I can how say that I found him to be very congenial, really a friendly a uh, casual fellow, not at all self-important or presumptuous. We really hit it off well. And I noticed that when he started pressing me about the resurrection of Jesus, and I started laying out the evidence, he retreated very quickly <laughs> and changed the subject, uh, which I thought was sort of interesting. But I, I greatly enjoyed uh, our conversation. If I could ask one more sort of that, that's sort of in the realm of people who deal with apologetics online and that sort of thing. You, you've appeared on Cameron Bertuzzi's channel uh, a few times. Uh, he he runs the Capture and Christianity YouTube channel and uh, and has spoken to many apologists over the years. Um, yeah, well, Cameron is sort of the Justin Brierley of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> but maybe, maybe. I, I wouldn't like to compare myself to Cameron. But anyway, um, well, he's been on an interesting journey. I don't know how much you're aware of this recently, Bill, but he's, he's recently converted to Catholicism. Um, yeah. And there does appear to be, says Marco, a renewed interest around Protestantism and Catholicism, and which one is a more faithful representation of Christianity. Well, Marco isn't asking you to comment on, on Cameron specifically, but but ask simply for you, Bill, what are your main reasons for being a Protestant rather than a Catholic? Mm -hmm. I suppose the primary reason is that I take as my authority for Christian doctrine Scripture alone, sola scriptura. Um, which was the watchword of the Reformation. Any authority that is invested in the church or ecclesiastical tradition or even creedal statements seems to me to be derivative from the Scriptures. And so there are lots of accreted doctrines that I don't think are scriptural and that I couldn't believe in it, even if I wanted to, like the ascension of Mary into heaven or Mary's immaculate conception. That the immaculate conception was not that Jesus was born without sin, but that was Mary was born without sin. Well, there's no scriptural grounds for that. So while I love and respect Catholic brethren, I, I couldn't be one of them because I just don't believe those things. Ruth, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, there's a really interesting question here from Justin Bennett, who says, as a former Christian, now an agnostic slash atheist, I've watched many of your debates and hold you in high regard as an excellent apologist and orator. But one of the many things I could not reconcile as I was deconstructing was of all the creator gods there are, how could I continue to believe in Yahweh as the one true God? How do you reconcile this outside of your own personal belief? Well, I would say that the arguments for the existence of God that I've defended, such as the contingency argument, the Kalam cosmological argument, the fine-tuning argument, the moral argument, narrow down the field of the world's religions to basically the great monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and perhaps deism. But it excludes all of the polytheistic and pantheistic religions. So if these arguments are correct, then you're already down to about only four alternatives. Now, beyond that point, beyond a generic monotheism, I think that you have to look at the person of Jesus of Nazareth and ask which religion gets Jesus of Nazareth right. And clearly it's not Islam. 
because Islam denies that Jesus of Nazareth was ever crucified, that he ever died, uh, uh, which is the one indisputable fact about the historical Jesus. Um, Judaism, I think, is fine up until the point of Jesus, but then it doesn't explain who Jesus was, particularly the evidence for his radical personal claims and his resurrection from the dead. If God really did raise Jesus from the dead, then he has unequivocally vindicated those radical personal claims for which he was crucified. Uh, and that implies, therefore, that Jesus is the self-revelation of God, and that rules out these other monotheistic faiths such as Judaism, Islam, and, and Deism. So that, in a nutshell, would be the reason for preferring Christian theism, and I, I hope that um, our listener that submitted this question will reconsider those arguments um, with a view toward coming back to Christ. I think we've got a number of people who, who are on different parts of the faith spectrum watching and listening tonight, Bill. Mark, for instance, describes himself as a respectful and curious doctor who has been following your work for some time now. Now, Mark says, I am a theist and a medical doctor. Uh, I've often heard stories of miraculous healings and other extraordinary events that are attributed to God's intervention. However, I've noticed that there seems to be an absence of such evidence in the scientific literature. Do you have any thoughts on why there seems to be a lack of empirical evidence for <sighs> miracles, Bill? You know, th this is really a controverted question. I have a friend in Southampton, Dr. Peter May, whom I'm, I know Justin knows. Well, I, and, I'm going to leap in, Bill, because we had Peter on the show just recently okay. uh, debating this very subject with Craig Keener, who I'm sure you're aware. Has right. Been has been cataloging modern evidence for miracles. And so they had quite the debate, I can tell you, on, on that show. Yeah. But yes, so but I, I think on. for our doctor friend who submitted the question, he needs to be aware that in order to be a Christian, you do not need to believe in contemporary miracles. Even if you think that Peter May is, is wrong, is overly skeptical, there is absolutely no doubt that this man is a deeply committed Christian who loves Jesus Christ, but he just doesn't think that God is in the business of doing the sort of miracles today that were done through the ministry of his son, Jesus of Nazareth. So this is a question on which Christians are at liberty to disagree, and if he is skeptical of modern medical miracles, that's just fine. If you don't mind me asking, Bill, where do you fall on that? Do you, it's not necessarily well, something I, to search I, greatly, but I really hope Peter is not right here. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to tie God's hands and say you can't do this anymore, Lord. <laughs> I, I want to be open to miracles, and yet on the other hand, I, I have to confess that there are a lot of really spurious miracle claims, and that many are poorly attested. I expressed a moment ago some skepticism about near-death experiences, for example. So I'm I'm open-minded. Mm. I'm ready to follow the evidence where it leads, um, but I, I don't have a, a strong view. Okay. Well, Bill, you mentioned near-death experiences there, but there's a question, I guess, kind of related to that um, from Gay Vivian, who says, Dr. Craig, can you tell me what happens to us when we die, including the final resurrection? Mm -hmm. I can tell you what the Bible says. Um, <laughs> what it says is that when your physical body dies and decays, your self or soul, that immaterial aspect of your being, goes to be either with God, if you are a regenerate uh, and redeemed person, or it goes into a situation of separation uh, from God. And it will stay in that intermediate state until the end of the universe, when God, so to speak, rolls up the scroll of human history and brings our space-time continuum to an end and inaugurates a new heavens and a new earth. And it will be at that time, at the end of the age, that the dead will be raised uh, and that they will be reunited with uh, an immortal, everlasting, uh, supernatural, spiritual body, uh, and then 
taken into the new heavens and the new earth if they are indeed children of God or separated from God forever. Bill, we we are rapidly approaching the end of our time, and you've you've answered all these questions so well, and that you haven't seen any of these in advance, of course. So thank you for for the excellent job you're doing. Um, this is a, a, just maybe finishing with a couple of slightly lighter ones because we've we've done some deep thinking today. Um, Zoe has a question: If you could have a coffee and a chat with anyone from the Bible except for Jesus, who would you choose and oh, why? Most certainly, Paul. I am in awe of the Apostle Paul. This man was a genius, a brilliant thinker, and moreover, what a soldier, what a brave man. When you think of how he was stoned and whipped and beaten, and yet every time would get up and go on to the next city and proclaim the gospel, I'm just in awe of someone with this kind of courage and perseverance. So I would love to sit down with the Apostle Paul and have a coffee. Yes, it would be his first time having coffee, I imagine, as he as he lived uh, <laughs> 2,000 years ago, but, but maybe he'll get to experience it in the in the new creation. Um, well, it's been fascinating. Maybe we've time for one more, and I wonder if I can just put this last one to you, because you, you were, in a sense, have devoted your life to um, to making the case for faith for n- a new generation of Christians today, and indeed skeptics who are interested in inquirers. But Andy wants to, to say, I'm a full-time pastor, Bill, with five young children. What advice do you have for parenting while also serving in full-time ministry, which, as you know, can be very challenging? I want my kids to know and love Jesus mm-hmm. and love and belong to a local church as adults. Any advice from yourself as a as a father yourself, Bill? <laughs> Yes, what I want to say to our fathers out there is that you fathers need to take ownership of instructing your children in Christian doctrine and apologetics, very simply at first from a young age, but then with increasing depth as they grow older. Do not leave this to mom or to the Sunday school to to do. The image of a male figure, a loving but authoritative father committed to the truth of Christian doctrine and training his children has a tremendous and, I think, life-lasting impact upon those kids. So start early, and, and you fathers take responsibility for doing this. One tool that we've tried to develop for doing this is our um, cartoon booklets called What is God Like? Mm. Featuring Brown Bear and Red Goose, uh, who teach their little children uh, (laughs) the attributes of God, what God is like. And it is a great way to start a conversation with your kids about things like God's being all-knowing or being eternal or all-powerful or what happens when you die. So those are our attempt to provide some tools for uh, young children to begin their training very early. Fantastic. Well, that probably does draw our time to a close. Thank you so much, Bill, for taking on all of those questions. I hope that uh, if your question didn't get answered, well, don't worry, because um, you can always submit questions uh, to Bill's own website. There's lots of opportunities to engage with Bill. And of course, you should go and read some of the many books that he's written as well. Bill, thank you so much for being our guest on the show today. It was my pleasure. 